good, good to see uh, you not wearing a shirt again, Iman. Uh, made it a bit casual today. Casual, perfectly in tune for our Italian friend who is uh, really enjoying life at the moment with a tan in Miami. Um, <laughs> before, before we introduce, so as, as you guys know, me and Iman are very selective with the guests that we bring on. Uh, whether that's a founder, it's an investor or an exec uh, within tech, whether you're building or investing. And I think this, this episode will be not just solely tech focused because me and Iman are both such nerds when it comes to, let's say, sleep, biohacking, optimization and performance, etc. And so it'll be a mix of everything. But um, a super interesting background, um, someone who's been sort of worked all over the world uh, from, you can call it, magic circle law firms in the UK that we have all the way to working in clean tech, Italy, New York, exited two companies, uh, and now working on a tech venture in sleep tech and, uh, has been doing really well, especially in the last couple of years where it's become sort of a household name in sleep tech. So yeah, welcome to the show, Matteo. I'm, I'm going to try and say it the Italian way, Franceschetti. Is that correct? Oh, you're really good. Congrats. <laughs> he, he wishes, he secretly wishes he was Italian is what it is. <laughs> His accent and pronunciation is perfect. He's like an Italian. What can I say? Um, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you, Matteo. I think we'll, we'll be good to kick off with a good background because like, as I just said, you were at Freshfields uh, and Allen and Overy, which is sort of two of the elite British, let's say, uh, magic circle law firms. And then developing, investing in clean tech. And then you've, you've done a lot of things. So if you can give us a good story from like how it all kicked off. Yeah. So I would actually start slightly before when I was a teenager, I was uh, obsessed with sport. I was uh, a tennis player. I was playing tournaments and then ski races. So it was all about sport. Um, then I got into, into law. I started studying law because uh, my dad was a lawyer. My sister is a lawyer. So at the time, I was not even thinking too much about my professional career because it was all about sport. Um, but then one day, I read an article about these big law firms doing these huge IPOs and these big transactions. And that is when everything changed in my mind. And I said, look, I don't, I don't want to be a traditional lawyer in my hometown. I, I want to do one of these things. And at the time I was not even speaking English and I think I was around 21, but I say, I want to get this. And, and so I started studying English. I, I graduated, uh, pretty well, um, with the maximum with honor, uh, because you need that to get into those law firms. And I studied the English. I was able to get in, um, none of my parents thought it would happen because they said, Oh, we don't know anyone there. There is no way you're going to make it. Uh, and, but I was persistent and, 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 and it happened. Um, so I spent five years there in, in the two, two of the largest law firms in the world. I started with Freshfields, then my boss became the head of finance at Allen Overy and he took me with him. So that, that is something I'm, I'm, I'm proud of. Um, and, and then I started my company, first company in clean tech. Uh, the reason is while I was at Allen Overy, I developed uh, a lot of expertise in project finance. There was this sort of hype in Europe around clean tech and solar. Italy um, was obviously at the, at the center of that hype. And so that is how everything started because in Italy, it's not that you raise money for your startup. It's really, really hard. I didn't know how what fundraising was at the time. And so... Myself and my co-founder were able to start the company working at night uh, and self-fund everything just with the, with the cash flow. So we never raised a penny for that company. I did two, one, one clean tech company in Europe, one in the US. And then I started Eight Sleep, which is now my, all that I do. When it comes to Eight Sleep, can you give our viewers a bit of a background as to kind of in simple language, what is eight sleep and what kind of market problem it's solving and, and how is it going? Yeah. Everything started from, from the fact that, um, five years ago, uh, I was the typical entrepreneur working long hours. I started looking at why do I need to sleep eight hours? Can I sleep less? What happens if I sleep less? And then I started wondering why 
why Elon Musk is taking me to Mars and I still spend a third of my life on a piece of dumb phone? Why no one reinvented sleep for 2000 years? It's a third of my life, eight hours a day. And at that point, you know, with my co-founders, we said, why don't we bring technology into sleep? There is no reason why technology should not enhance your sleep performance. And, and that is the problem we wanted to solve since from the beginning. So you guys kicked off in Stanford University's Accelerator StarTex. Was this back in 2014? 2014, right? 15. 2015, but okay. That, but, but there is a funny story there. The none of us went to Stanford, <laughs> uh, but uh, they liked what we were doing. And so they, there was an exception in the rules where from time to time they could admit a company, even if it was not funded by Stanford alumni. Um, and that's how we got in. And then shortly after, uh, you went through Y Combinator, right? So let us know what, what the experience was like through YC. And this was a few years ago um, when it was still very competitive, uh, may, maybe slightly less competitive than now, but still it's a huge uh, achievement to have got in given the competition. So let us, let us know like, how that experience was. So we got rejected twice, and, uh, but we were persistent. And, and then we got in the third time. Um, we were almost not applying the third time. And so we debated until really the, the day before. And then we say, okay, let's do it, but we'll just up, make the whole application in very few hours, all that. And, and, and it happened. Um, and I think it has been one of the greatest things um, that, that happened to us. First, because, I mean, the YC experience was great. So um, we learned a lot. And, and still today, a lot of what we do or how we approach problems comes from what we have learned during those days. And then we were very lucky with our partners. Uh, we had Michael Seibel, who now is the CEO of YC. And so we were able to build a, a very close relationship with him. We had Gary Tan, who now runs Initialize. And then we have Dalton. Um, so uh, it, it, we were able to build a beautiful relationship that we still maintain. In, in terms of those guys that you mentioned, big hitting names, um, Gary Tan is actually one of our favorite podcasters. He does a lot of similar content to, to what we do. And I guess given that you've had sort of access to these people, what, what's your thoughts in terms of the value they add to you? Because I understand that they can help you, you know, craft how you articulate your business and how you talk about uh, the value proposition of the business. But in terms of the mentoring aspect, um, and the ability to kind of bring you up and give you the confidence. D did you feel that, you know, YC and those other, th those other accelerators that exist out there can give you that confidence and that drive and mentorship that you need? Yeah, right. I think it was a game changer for us. It was, they, they push really hard on no bullshit. So don't, don't tell me bullshit, just you not know, cut it through the chase. Uh, focus, do a few things really, really well and be obsessed with your customer. And so then you're, you're able to transfer these basic principles to your whole team and you have even more credibility because now you're part of YC and, and, and these amazing people that you now they share their knowledge. And, and there is where there was the game changer for us. We were able to achieve in three months at the time, probably what would have taken us six months, just because it's focus and you have these um, office hours every, every other week. And now there is, there is your pride. Uh, after two weeks, you want to go there and you want to have deliver what you promise. And so that gives you the extra energy to make it happen. So since then, you guys have raised 70 million, roughly US dollars from the likes of Founders Fund, uh, Coastal Ventures, Craft Ventures, angels such as Jason Calacanis, uh, in addition to the sort of big hitting names that you just said from YC. Um, how has the journey been in the last five years? And what I mean by that is if you could also lead into the sort of core product range that you have at the moment uh, and the struggles you went through in the early days until you reached scale and raised funding. And what I mean by that is after YC, uh, you may have not had funding immediately. And obviously you have to go through the process of really being smart in terms of how you grow the business, especially in the D2C 
most people throw money at, let's say, paid traffic. But what I've noticed and what I love is your growth method has been a mix of strategies. It's been very organic. Uh, you're all over many podcasts. You're all over Twitter. You're responding to everyone. So if you can just dive in from the early days to, to raising funding and to, to modern day, just the journey so far and the products that you have and how you've grown it. Yeah. So on the product side, we, we started with the cover that could be installed on a bed and tracks your sleep. We always knew that one, what we wanted to do was the pod, which has thermal regulation. So we changed the temperature of your body while you are asleep in order to improve your sleep performance. And the reason is our vision is what if in 10 years you could sleep only six hours and get more rest than when you were sleeping eight hours. And then on top of that, what if your bed becomes a medical grade device that lets you know if you're sick? That's what we are building. And at the beginning, we didn't have the money. Um, and the first step was to start collecting data. Once we started collecting data, we started to have early traction and we were able to raise more money from, from COSLA and then Thunders Fund to really develop what is our current hero product. Um, the reality is like a startup is you, you struggle during the whole journey, right? And it's like a roller coasters. You have good times and you have really bad times and it's part of the game. So um, you need to live with that. Everyone goes through that. So if I look at the journey during the five, the, the, these five years, Obviously, if you oversimplify, there are these beautiful stories, Stanford, YC, beautiful investors, you know, some of the best minds in the Valley joining us and say, oh, look at this guy, how, how easy it was. Um, but I, I, I could talk for hours about all the, the, the tough times where, where we were uh, almost dead and, and we, saved the, uh, we saved the company at the last second. The... Um there's a really interesting point you picked up on, right? Which was you collected data in the first few sort of in the first year, first few months in your sort of bootstrapping phase. I know that your product works with, it has its own algorithm, right? So it works with AI and, and machine learning algorithms. Could you, could you explain in a little bit more detail what, what drives the data capture and why you needed that data in the initial period? I'm assuming it was to help the kind of machine learning algorithm you had develop itself, but a yeah. little bit more detail on that would be useful. Yeah. Also, I'm, I'm assuming it was a bit of a struggle for you guys to find engineers because uh, I don't know where I, where I read or heard, it probably took you two years to develop the product initially. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So going one by one. So our vision again is to compress sleep and to transform your bed in a medical grade device that can save your life. For both these two things, we need to know what's going on in your body. For the medical grade part, for obvious reasons, we need to know your heart rate. We need to know your respiration. We, know to, we need to know your sleep. But also to compress sleep, we need that because in particular, temperature needs to change during the night based on your biometrics. When you hear people saying, oh, you should sleep the whole night at 68 degrees, that's bullshit. That's wrong. Temperature keeps changing during the night. Your body temperature changes. And so the bed and the environment, they need to adjust accordingly to maximize your sleep. Um, and that's why we are not a mattress company. We are really a, a digital health company. For us, the mattress is a, the perfect form factor because it is a device that you use every day. You are in contact with that and has a lot of space. So we can embed a lot of sensors to really track everything about your health. Um, in terms of the, the, I think the, the, the struggles on the hardware side, that is one of the challenges of hardware first, but it's even a bigger challenge, um, when you go through crowdfunding campaigns. So everything for us started with a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo. The campaign went well, uh, overall we sold 8,000 units in pre-orders and building these 8,000 units. So going from zero to 8,000 is a really big challenge, in particular, if you didn't already have a lot of hardware experience. And so it took us time. It took us, yeah, somewhere more around, I think, 18 months around there uh, to really ship our first product. And it's challenging because first, 
you don't have a lot of resources to really hire a large team. At least that was our case. Second, it's hard to know exactly who you need to hire unless you have a lot of hardware experience. And so there is where we were pushed really hard by the, you know, the, the, the YC team to really try to make progress as fast as possible. And, and that is when I also moved to China for a couple of months um, to really get things done. Uh, because otherwise it was it was not happening. We had to find a manufacturer. We had to find you not know, put together the whole supply chain. So essentially, the ther- correct me if I'm wrong. The thermal engine behind the product. So you guys are using machine learning, artificial artificial intelligence to adjust the temperature during the night. Um, and essentially, it's at the core of it here is data play, anonymous, of course, uh, and mm-hmm. it's similar to let's say what let's say Tesla is doing to driving, you guys are doing to sleep. And I think it's super interesting because how, for example, let's say Peloton gathers your data around your training. Um, and, and, you know, you, you read things and you hear things that how, okay, they're going to move to, let's say your real estate gym model, where you go into a gym, you upload your data and you just carry on training on a Peloton. You guys gather the sleep data. And then in the future, for example, I think hotels can leverage even this kind of data for business travel is what you guys do. So if let's say you're on business and you check into a hotel and they're using um, an eight sleep mattress, then you can sort of load your data and that's similar to how you're on a Peloton. So are you guys currently, is, is that in the pipeline or are there any ideas in terms of doing a B2B front as well and expanding into hotels? Yeah, I, th- I think that as the company gets scale and uh, we get known, um, some of the best hotels um, will want us to be part of their experience. And, and the reason is based on what we see from all our customers, right? Once, once you start using the pod, it's really hard to go back to a dumb mattress because it's like going on a car without AC or living in a house without AC when outside it's hot, right? It's, say, it, it just looks unnatural that you don't have this thermoregulation which you have again in your house and you have in your car. So it becomes, what we have seen is the biggest aha moment for our customers is the first time they travel because they just miss their bed because they don't have those functionalities anymore. The, um, you, you mentioned Cyrus, you mentioned something interesting where you said, um, the Tesla equivalent right and tesla so so just by way of background mateo my, i i work in um in clean tech so i have a very strong opinions about tesla but the the key thing about tesla is obviously the data it gathers and what it can do with that data and how it pivots i'm really interested to hear from you kind of what you you mentioned that you know there's b2b partnerships that you could be doing but w- what else could you do what is what is the value that comes from gathering this data? Because I, un- I can understand there are adjacencies across markets, not just in the market that you're in. And you mentioned something in your opening, um, opening gambit where you said, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but something along the lines of, we're not a, we're not a sleep company. We're, we're, we're specific to wellness. It's a broader brand. It's a broader thing we're trying to solve. And so, are there any market adjacencies, much like Tesla moved into energy? Is there anything that you could move into that is sort of parallel to the sleep market? Yeah, I, I think as the company grows, we will really become a health company, not just a sleep company, right? So to our data, we will be able to see arrhythmia. We might be able to predict strokes. Um, we, we see how you're aging because your heart rate today is different from your heart rate in three years from now and six years from now. Uh, we can see sleep apnea. We can see snoring. And then with new sensors that we are testing and experimenting with, um, we might be able to, to see much deeper into your body if there is anything wrong. So what if going to bed was better than going to your doctor for a checkup? And we are not here to replace the doctor, let's be clear, but we are here to give more tools to your doctor to know in real time if there is any change inside your body. That is, that is my dream, to transform your bed in an MRI that scans you every single night. Awesome. Um, 
So over the years, I've Iman knows very well. I've I've done a lot of you could call it as the tech bros say the biohacking and all of this. Most of it, which he's, I, he's obsessed. He is fucking obsessed with this stuff. Most of it, which is nonsense, is is my conclusion. But I mean, some of the sort of uh, more important figures who speak a lot of truth. I mean, you've got Dr. Rhonda Patrick, Dr. David Sinclair, Ben Greenfield, Dr. Matthew Walker. So what I've taken away from these people is essentially you know, on sleep, longevity, you can do intermittent fasting, you can do cold exposure, you can do all of these things, but there's nothing at the core root of it that is as important as sleep. Um, and what I wanted to ask, is it true that if you can get just 25% deep sleep and 25% REM sleep, then that's really all you need. And what eight sleep does is you can essentially reduce the eight hours requirement of sleep per night to let's say six uh, if you need to get up earlier and the bed, let's say you need to get up at 5 a.m. for business, you're traveling and the bed will essentially through temperature, through, through the thermoregulation and the temperature and everything, wake you up in a way whereby your sleep is not disrupted and you've had the correct REM and deep sleep as well. Yeah. So based on our data, our customers on average, they fall asleep faster. Um, they get more restful sleep. So we can drop uh, uh, in, a, in a substantial amount the number of wake ups and tosses and turns. And then there is also plenty of scientific evidence where through thermoregulation, you can get up to 20% more deep sleep and you can get more REM. We also have a thermoregulated alarm. So we use temperature to wake you up gently without any alarm, sound alarm going off. Um, and then we also have vibration. So it's a gentle vibration plus this temperature that really wakes up your body during the more or less 30 minutes before um, your wake up time. Um, so we are able to do all those, all those things right now. Um, in terms of the importance of sleep, obviously you, you mentioned big names. Um, most of them know they're doctors and, and professors. So they have run studies for, for years. Um, about the importance of sleep. But oversimplified health is based on three pillars. It's based on sleep, nutrition, and exercise. But there is no nutrition and exercise if you sleep two hours a night. So sleep comes first. And sleep has an impact on your hormones, has an impact on your heart rate, on your longevity, on your health in general that sleep alone wouldn't be enough, then you need to take care of what you eat and how much you exercise. But again, these three pillars come in an order and the first pillar is sleep because it gives you the energy, right? If you are sleep deprived, you start craving junk food. If you're sleep deprived, you're tired and you will not find very likely, you will not find the energy to then train. So they are interconnected. Can you talk about, um, because I feel like a part of you started this business because of obviously you worked in magic circle law firms. Just for context, my background previously was tech banking, Iman, strategy consulting. So we've kind of done the hours as well. And uh, in those industries, I remember being at a dinner once, a closing dinner with lawyers, and it was a tapas dinner, probably two pieces of salami each and 10 glasses of wine down. And everyone's saying, mm, wow, what a lovely dinner. And I was thinking, this is not a dinner. Um, and I feel like you, you may have created this company through the struggles you went through as a lawyer. Um, can you also talk about, because as, when I left corporate, I've, I stopped alcohol and I've never touched it since, never planned to again, it's drastically improved uh, overall health um, and, and sort of brain function, memory, ev everything I feel. Uh, can you talk about like the importance of how those external factors affect sleep as well really quickly? Yeah. So there are two, two big factors. One is alcohol and one is caffeine. Alcohol has a major impact on the quality of your sleep. It has an impact on your sleep stages, has an impact on your HRV, so heart rate variability, on your heart rate at rest. So substantially, it's very likely, and then I will explain why very likely, that alcohol has an impact on your sleep quality. The reason why I say very likely is there is another fundamental piece of our theory that sleep, but like health in general, is very personalized and it changes from individual to individual. So it could be that uh, I suffer alcohol more than you 
it might happen that um, for me, alcohol is really bad, but it's not for you. It could be that I should stop drinking four hours before going to bed and I'm fine, but it could even be that I should stop six hours before. The bottom line is obviously you should test and check what works or what doesn't work for you. But it's very likely that alcohol, in particular, if you, if you just dra- drank a couple of cocktails right before bed, will have a negative impact on your sleep quality. Same thing for coffee. You know, co- Italians, they drink coffee even at night. So you when have I go the back, best wine and you have the yeah. best coffee and you're yeah. saying this. <laughs> I, I struggle so much when I go back to my country, even just for vacation, because first they look at you like, you're really not ordering wine with, with your meal. And then when, when uh, no, after dinner, they offer you the dessert, which I don't order because I'm on a keto. And then they offer you a coffee or, or a shot of alcohol. And I don't take any of those. And, and so they look at me like if I'm rude. And you, so you just want the check and then, yeah, I, I'm good. Um, but so coffee can have an impact on your sleep quality too. In my case, I stopped drinking coffee between eight and 10 hours before going to bed. That is the recommended time. But it might be that you can drink coffee until 5 p.m. and you're completely fine. So you just need to test that. But the rule of thumb is to stop around eight hours before going to bed. You you spoke about, you've obviously spoken about sleep and you've just spoken about nutrition, your your keto. Um, What about your fitness routine? What what do you do fitness-wise to to, you know, those three pillars, what's the fitness pillar like? Yeah, there are three things I really focus on um, heat. So high intensity interval training. So you try really to do 30 minutes to an hour where you keep spiking your heart rate. And I have seen that is the, is the type of exercise that helps me the most in reducing my heart rate at rest. And then there is weightlifting. I just bought a tunnel. Uh, that they can use to to train at home. Uh, But in general, I have always used dumbbells and and not train, push-ups, anything you can think of. And the third one, which is less mentioned, uh, but is a lot of mobility exercises. So if you listen to Peter Atia and you know think in terms of longevity, it's really important that you try to maintain the best mobility you can. And so uh, in particular, at night before going to bed, I do mobility exercises, like kind of stretching um, to make sure that I'm uh, still pretty flexible. Awesome. Um, I just want to quickly ask your view on the current D2C market, uh, especially the mattress space, which earlier we referred to as the dumb mattress space. Um, Iman's laughing because I wrote an article recently about the irrationality in tech markets. Uh, which is on our website, rationalvc.com. And I wrote about, not targeting anyone, but I gave one example of Casper, who uh, they filed for an IPO, went public, 300 million top line, uh, 70 million lost bottom line, which is a, which is not even true bottom line. Um, and, you know, others are just essentially mattress companies and there's no heavy R&D, there's heavy CPA, average of $350 uh, per, you know, acquisition, per client acquisition, and at least two dozen D2C brands in this space in Western Europe alone with identical products. And in many cases, they're just using the same factory, which are like sinking pits for marketing euros or pounds or whatever. So the product itself doesn't allow for cross-selling or new product additions easily. Paid acquisition is sort of costly, inorganic, no longevity. Whereas you guys, I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you've done is well, you're leveraging data. You've built a true tech company. There hasn't been a huge focus, as I said early on, paid traffic. Um, and your product is so impressive that on my Twitter feed, there's not a single day that I don't see dozens of testimonials. Uh, whereas you never see that with the likes of Casper. And I feel like you guys have, yes, you've been around for years, but I feel like your growth has been so exponential because of not following the typical status quo, let's say strategy that the other dumb mattress companies have. Um, what do you make, and, and your product's very sticky. You seem to have a lot of high retention, customer loyalty. What is your view of the D2C market and the struggles of, uh, you know, what are the mistakes you basically see other D2C brands making that I haven't outlined? Yeah, um, it, it, it's a good question. I mean, obviously all, all these startups and company, right? I, I have a lot of respect for them, like uh, any entrepreneur and founder. Um, Obviously, we have a very different perspective. 
two things. I think for, for all of them was to really capture an entry level market, right? So the, the low end of the market um, with, with a product that is commoditized. Because at the end of the day, buying foam is really simple. You could buy a, you could call a mattress manufacturer today and start the business tomorrow. Um, it, you just buy foam, and instead of going to Costco or, an, or another market, you go to a mattress manufacturer. Um, and that's why the the entry barrier is so low, and that's why so many players were able to to start that type of business. In our case, we try to uh, build the technological mode first. Because the whole assumption of how we started this business was, again, how do we enhance your sleep performance? How can you sleep less and how can we save your life? And to do that, you need hardcore technology, which is expensive and is also painful to be built. Um, so that means we have a higher price point that in particular in the US is not um, an expensive product in the mattress business. We are a mid tier, meaning there is an entry level tier around thousand bucks where 99% of the competitors are. And then you have a mid tier in the two to three K. And then there is a very expensive market that is five to 10 K. Um, we are in the middle one. Um, and the, the good thing here is, um, our customer is much less price sensitive because they are really paying a price for a benefit. They're not buying a commodity that is foam just to lie over it because they, they don't want to lie over the floor. They are really buying a piece of technology. And so when you guys earlier were talking about companies like Tesla and Peloton, um, those are the companies we respect the most. So we really admire them. They have a beautiful brand. Peloton sells D2C. Even Tesla, you can buy online. But you're really buying a piece of technological art that has a, a, a strong technological moat. We hope to be the same, but for sleep and, and over time for health. Who, who's your closest competitor then, if, if those guys are targeting the lower end of the market? It's a good question, meaning if, if you want, we are a sort of Apple watch of sleep. But in reality, we are very different from a wearable because wearables, they end their work with the data. Okay, this is your data. This is a couple of recommendations. Good luck. In our case, data is the starting point. Once we have the data, we start doing the job for you. We start adjusting the environment and the temperature to optimize your sleep. But you don't have to do anything, right? We, we have your back. As you are asleep, we will take care of you and we will keep tweaking things until when we improve your sleep performance. No wearable does that. So it's, think of almost an, a Tesla autopilot. You know, the car is driving for you. It gives you time back. It makes things easier for you. We try to do the same with your sleep performance. So what have been your, let's say, let's call it biggest struggles with growing the company? Not in the early days. I'm talking about, let's say, the last two, three years in particular. Uh, what has been causing a bit of friction? Uh, and sort of second follow-on question to that really is, what have you guys gained from, you know, what are some investor lessons that you've learned that have changed the trajectory of the business, if any? Investor lesson is focus, do less, but do it really, really well. Um, second, build a technological moat. And third, have great unit economics, build a real business. Um, in terms of struggles, a lot, <laughs> a lot of them. <laughs> we, could, we could spend uh, probably a day talking about that. I would say the biggest is hiring, right? You're really the, 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 the team you build, the company is the team you build, and that is a big principle of Vinod Kosla. Uh, and so making sure you hire the best people and the definition of best is really complicated, right? Because a, a startup is a very high intensity environment. People need to be almost entrepreneurs. They need to understand ownership. They need to get things done quickly. They need to be open to continuous readjustments. So hiring is definitely one of the biggest challenges. Um, and second is um, a startup is a dynamic animal, meaning what works today will not likely work in three months from now or six months from now, any process, even how you run certain meetings or the type of meetings. And so you need to be able to um, adjust continuously 
and uh, reinvent yourself over time as the, the company scales. It's, it's quite interesting to hear you, to hear you say um, that hiring is one of the toughest parts. So I think every founder we've spoken to um, pretty much echoes that. And I think it comes from two spaces. I think the first is if you're a technical person, a technical founder, it's quite difficult to hire a non-technical person because you don't really know what good looks like. However, I think it's a lot easier than doing it the other way around. Um, which you alluded to earlier on, where where you said, um, you know, it took time to build because it was difficult to find, you know, the right people um, with the right skill set, and it must be really hard to do that. It must be doubly hard to do that when you don't have the technical background yourself, and you're trying to solve something that is as novel as the problem and as complex as the problem that you're trying to solve. Let me just stay on that failure. Um, sort of area for just for one more minute, if that's okay. You're you're quite an exceptional person from what we've heard on on this podcast so far, right? You've done a whole bunch of stuff, um, and you're solving really important societal problems. So, you know, you were in renewables, so you were trying to solve the climate crisis. You're now trying to you know, work on the wellness crisis. You've got a varied and impressive CV, right? But I, I want to know more about your personal struggle to get to where you are today is there anything any example that jumps out at you that you kind of felt that oh shit this is the end but then you were like actually it completely changed my trajectory personally to get to where i am yeah even there are obviously a lot of struggles right and and i had different types of struggles in in the different phases right first struggle was how do I get into these big law firms? I had no contacts. I, I didn't know anyone. So I really went through the, the, the process of a cold email to their HR department. Um, and, and I mean, my family has always been supportive, uh, but no one w- was really believing that that would happen. Uh, and so there, I think it was the struggle. Then there was the struggle of my dad. He has his small law firm and, and so obviously he would have liked me to be with him and he was not taking super well the fact that, oh, I was trying to join these big guys like saying, oh, you're, you're not good enough. Um, so there was that struggle. Another big struggle was when I moved from, from the first company in Europe to the US. I moved to the US, I didn't know anyone. And um, I didn't know the habits, I didn't know the culture. I, so it was really hard to entertain any discussion outside business. And also on the business side, Americans are very different from Europeans. And so they immediately judge you. Oh, you're the Italian. And they don't do it with you know, to offend you, but it's part of the culture here. And because Italians are different, right? They have different types of skills. And then there was another big challenge um, when I moved from clean tech to, to eight sleep which was a, a really you know, tech startup because again, all the network that I built before was now not useful, right? And the previous investor, the previous business, it, it was like saying, oh, I have to restart from zero. No one knew my company, no one knew what I have done. So all that kind of you know, previous experience was almost irrelevant. Um, and I didn't have trust, which is, instead in Silicon Valley is really important, right? You get connected to people, through people, you know, and other people vouch for you. And none of that was existing for me. And so it was really hard and energy demanding to always say, this is my third company and fuck, I have to, to prove myself again. I really have zero connections. Um, and I think now I'm really happy that I'm, I'm in the US. Um, I work with some of the best investors in Silicon Valley because hopefully if I will keep staying in tech, as I hope and I intend to do, uh, I start building a little bit of reputation and people know that, that I'm, I'm a serious person. Cool. Matteo, I, I want to know what are your long-term plans with 8Sleep and just where you want to take the company? Yeah, I think we are really at 5% of what we want to achieve. So um, 
I'm, I'm here to stay and, and I hope I can keep leading this, this company for a very long time. If we really want to achieve the things that we are, that we share, even in this chat with you, we need time. We need 20 years, right? To start saving millions of lives. Um, and so what that means from a business perspective, we don't know, but obviously the company will need capital, but that capital hopefully will be a consequence of achieving new milestones and inflection points. Um, I need to raise my own bar if the company grows to be able to keep leading it. Um, but my idea is let, let's save lives and let's compress sleep for the next 20 years. You, you picked up on a really interesting point where you said, you know, you've got this grand vision, right? You want to help save lives. The metric you're going by is not your top line, bottom line. It's how many lives do I save, right? It, it picks up into a, something earlier you said, which was around when you got to, um, got to the US, essentially being an immigrant, uh, you found it difficult to build the connections with you know, there was no connections in the first instance um, with people there that wasn't that weren't professional in, in, in the initial sense. What, given that you're doing something quite noble, what has been the take of venture specifically? So these big names we mentioned earlier that you're that you're involved with and have invested. And also given that your co-founders, uh, I believe, Alexandra and Massimo, they're Mexican and Italian, right? Um, so you're all kind of from outside the US. What's your view on kind of how venture in particular, how diverse venture is, but how well they took you in, or if, if they didn't take you in that well to start with, what, what's your views on diversity in the space? I think they took us in well. Um, because at the end of the day, what matters is really results. That is one of the beauty of the US. You, you deliver, you will have opportunities. And I think what was hard in particular at the beginning, right? You are immigrants. We don't come from any university here. So it was really hard to prove or to have any data point that we were reliable people and people that could build the a solid and great business, right? In, in Silicon Valley, investors, they look for data points. It could be talking to, okay, you went to Stanford or you went to Harvard, or I know this person that was in your class and he can vouch for you, or you have done this company in the past and this company was successful. We were unable to articulate any data point that would make us credible. Uh, there is where we struggle. Then I, and so probably it took us longer to have access to some of the best VCs. Um, and the first step was really to get into Y Combinator that really now was a stamp. Okay, you're a YC company. And then from there, we were able to become a KV company, Cosla company, and, and then a funders fund company. And then we have raised a decent am amount of money. So it, it took us longer, um, I think, to build that trust that now hopefully we start having um, five years in. So Matteo, I think what some people sort of put their success down to is different factors. Some people will say, oh, it's my focus on, let's say, customer obsession. Some would say it's the people around me. Uh, some would say it's family, sort of, I have three, four people that I go to for advice. Um, but you've had two exits, now a third venture, which is going really well. What would you say are the sort of the, just a few foundational pillars or things that have really helped you that you, that you'd advise sort of founders or budding founders in terms of, uh, the things that they should really be practicing. Um, you need to be persistent. It will be hard and, and it's normal as part of the game. Um, you need uh, to surround yourself with people you like to work with, because again, you will go to up, ups and downs. Right. And so is your, co your relationship with your co-founders is like a marriage and, and you need to manage that relation properly, but it needs to have you know, the, the, the right foundations to be successful. Um, and then move fast. Uh, that, that is a, is a sentence I always, I always repeat to my team. And the reason to move fast is you want to learn fast so you can adjust. 
Um, so these are the three, the three pillars. It's going to be tough. So be persistent, work with people uh, you get along with and just move as fast as possible. Is, is there anything specific to um, people that are not from the US or that are from diverse backgrounds that would be different to, to what you've just said? People coming to the US or people staying yeah, Im- abroad? Im- Im- immigrants that are founders that want to that wanna start businesses in the US and want to have as much yeah. success as you had. I think... It will be it will be harder. It depends when you move, right? Because if you move that you're six years old, you still watch their TV, you still learn what is happening, you you learn their culture. But if like me, you move when now you're in your late twenties, it's much more complicated because you really know nothing about them. You, you don't know about their jokes. You don't know about TV programs that were successful two years ago. And so, just take your time and and try to spend also time to understand how it works here, both business and general culture. So you will have topics of discussions um, when you have dinner with, with, with people here. So Matteo, we've, we've done an episode previously, which is advice to let's say young people or graduates who are stuck between, do I go into finance or law? Like let's say me and Iman went into finance, you went into law, or do I join a startup straight out of university? Um, and I suppose from someone who's been at, let's say, the t- two of the most elite British law firms, uh, and now, I mean, a few people have said, oh, you, you need to ask Matteo this question. What would you advise a young graduate who's stuck between their parents or families pushing them, you need to go into either banking or law versus joining a startup? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And, and actually, I think Paul Graham touched on this point recently. And I think what you need to do is to really analyze who you are, meaning investment banking and and, law firms. They could still be very exciting if you don't want to innovate on the type of work, but you just want to do that work really, really well, right? So is is a well-known activity. People know what to do. There is nothing to be innovative. You just need to do it. You need to now work really hard and just deliver. Well, instead, when you get into startups, there is this continuous unknown. Even myself as a CEO, I, I don't know many of the things we are going through. And so you just follow your gut and you try to innovate. And so based on your personality, if you are not an innovator or if you don't enjoy being in the in the unknown territory, you don't want to do that because it would be too painful. So just based on who you are and your personality, try to understand which of these two type of jobs fits better for you well, did you did you make the right choice in going into law first and then going to, into startups would, would you say it was the right choice in in hindsight i think it was for me because it gave me a lot of discipline right i learned a lot from my boss and i learned working hard i learned about being very precise i learned how to negotiate i learned how to really know at the time I was going with him and meeting these top managers. And so now when it happens and I'm the CEO of the company, even if I talk to big people at Amazon, um, I know how to handle that relationship because I had seen it before. So I'm, I'm glad that I did it. Um, there is, I think, a Peter Thiel rule or Thunderspan rule that you shouldn't spend too much time in, in big law firms or investment banking or consulting, you should spend just a couple of years to really understand how it works and learn this discipline, but move away soon enough before you become um, stuck into that mentality and that process. So get the best out of everything. So, so I'm, I'm here, I'm in consulting now for, for five years, so I, I should leave definitely. Yeah, <laughs> it's time to leave. I've been telling him, I've been telling him, you know, um, Matteo, so just before we start to wrap up, I suppose just a few, uh, sort of final non, non eight sleep related questions. Um, sort of the stuff me and your mind geek out about what's, what's your morning routine run us through. Yeah. So, um, before COVID I was waking up around six. Now I wake up somewhere between six thirty and seven. Um, I immediately, even if it's bad, check emails and revenue. But uh, I wonder what happened during the night. And then I read the news 
Um, and so from, from Twitter to Wall Street Journal to everything just to be up to date. Um, and then usually I train in the morning or I train uh, around lunchtime, so it depends. Um, but by 8.30, I'm, I'm already working. On Mondays, I start earlier. I start at 8 a.m. Who, who's, your, who's your favorite entrepreneur of all time? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the first obvious is obviously Elon for what he's doing, how he's disrupting the world. Um, I have a lot of uh, um, admiration for the founder of Nike. I don't know if you read uh, Shoe Dog, but that, that yeah, book is nice. my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's awesome. Um, and also Walt Disney. I read recently his book and his, uh, you know, the creativity that was behind that man and how many times he he failed but then he was able to take the company to the next level that i mean those stories and biographies are always exciting even richard branson is another person i, I admire a lot. and if you could meet anyone in history dead or alive who would it be i i don't have a strong political position but it would be barack obama uh, and not because Democrats versus Republican, not all of that. I just really admire his story, what he has done and, and his empathy. And so I would love to spend a dinner with him and, and say, man, tell me more about those eight years. I mean, what, what it looks like to, to, to run the United States. What, what did you go through? You, you wouldn't want to ask Trump those questions, just Obama. <laughs> I would like to ask about Obama. Yeah. <laughs> So you mentioned uh, Shoe Dog. What's uh, what would you say your favorite book of all time? Um, there are three I really like. There is Shoe Dog, so I, I would say Shoe Dog. Period. Uh, I really like the Almanac of Naval. I just read it. It's awesome. Uh, a lot of great uh, lessons. And then you should read Why We Sleep from Matthew Walker. Um, I think it re will really open your eyes about the importance of sleep and the correlation between good sleep and, and health and longevity. We, we quote Naval quite regularly, and uh, this was probably the first episode we never quoted him, which is why Iman's laughing until you brought him up. So, uh, Perfect. Cool. I think um, final question before we wrap up, because uh, obviously we're in the UK, we're in Europe, but we're, our listeners are US and Europe all over the world. Um, are you long or short European tech long term? It's, it's a tricky question. Um, so it, the, I, I think on pure software, it, I'm long. Uh, on anything that is hardware related is much more difficult because Europe is much more fragmented than the US. And so even when we look at our expansion, um, UK is different from Germany, from Italy. Uh, credit card adoption is still much more complicated and obviously all the regulations. Um, so it's, it's challenging. I still think that China first, US second, and then probably Europe. Yeah, agreed. And um, just finally, any you mentioned plans for expansion because me and Iman are waiting to order for the UK. Um, any any near term plans, or we should just stay put for now and uh, you'll announce something in the future. You should stay put a little bit, but um, sooner or later is is, is going to happen. We are going to take care of you. Awesome. And where can people find you, uh, yourself and 8sleep? Yeah. So 8sleep.com, 8 like the number, E-I-G-H-T sleep.com. Um, on the homepage, there is also a, a link to my Twitter. As you were saying, I'm really active there. So you can just tweet at me and, and I'll get back to you. Uh, I try to have a very direct relationship with, uh, with our tribe. Awesome. Matteo, absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll have you on again when you've done the IPO and uh, you, you've hit all the monstrous uh, metrics that no one expects you to hit because we, we know that you can. So IPO appreciate or, it. IPO or SPAC. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, it's great to have you. Thank you very much.